Well, Manjeka, first I'd like to acknowledge that we're organizing this event from the unceded lands of the Kulin and nearby nations. Our speaker, Tim, is on Wurundjeri land, as are Chris, Howard and Matt, our fellow presenters. I'm on Wadawurrung country, and our computer expert, David, is on Tangerun country. They have all cared for and managed these lands in a sustainable and responsible manner for many tens of thousands of years. When the initial settlers arrived, the common statement was the land was like a gentleman's park and the soils so friable with good grasses and bulbs. We need to respond to their welcome to country by also truly caring for this country. We have much to learn from them, not only on their land, farming and fire practices, but also their governance procedures, which led to no major wars across this continent for many tens of thousands of years. I offer my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and to all their mobs and to people from other mobs who are attending today, and to all of you who have logged in from near and also from far away. Hi, I'm Rob Gardner, and I help support these meetings with Chris, Howard, and various other people. Today, my particular thanks to Dave, who is managing all the activities in the background. Firstly, a little housekeeping. Tonight's presentation and Q&A will be recorded and available to download in a few days time from the Renew website. If you have any technical problems or general comments, please use the chat button at the bottom left. If you have questions, enter them at any time using the Q&A button on the bottom center. Keep the questions fairly short if possible. We usually have lots of questions, so we'll probably consolidate some and then cover as many as possible in the time available. A few of you may be new to Renew, so briefly, Renew was formed in 1980 to promote sustainability in all its forms. It is best known for its two magazines, Renew and Sanctuary, but also events such as uh, Sustainable House Day in September, October, and Speed Date and Experts uh, running through the year, also electric vehicle fairs and many other fairs and events. However, it also has a significant research section and a lobbying group. Free modeling packages, Sonolator and Tankolator, and also an advisory service aimed not only at households, but also offering it to businesses and government. Tonight, we are very fortunate to have Tim Forsey making a present presentation before an extensive Q and two other speakers after that and then an extensive Q&A session. Uh, most of new members will know Tim. He's a chemical engineer and has, for the last 12 years, uh, been doing home advisory work and has already clocked up more than a thousand uh, home advisory six, uh, reports. For renew previous Renew attendees, he'll be well known for his talks on heat pumps getting off gas, and several other topics. He's a highly regarded in the sustainable ind industry uh, and has extensive knowledge, which we are going to learn a little bit about tonight. So that's enough from me, and over to you, Tim. Very good, thanks a lot, Robin. And uh, welcome to everybody here tonight. Thanks to the organizers. I'll try and share this screen here because I'm not much to look at. So we'll see how that goes. Get over to the presentation. And hopefully you all can see the presentation there. So I'll be talking about increasing home comfort and energy efficiency for renters and homeowners. So let's get into it. If I could advance the slide, there we go. It's just a little bit about me to begin with. Um, I grew up on a dairy farm back in America where we had ice and snow and things like that. So houses can be a little different over there. But uh, growing up on a, on a farm, you uh, learn to be conservative. You like to conserve things. So you don't waste things. You don't waste energy or anything else. So uh, I think that had something to do with uh, 
where I am today. And then I studied, studied as a chemical engineer and then traveled around the world working in oil refineries and chemical plants and offshore oil platforms, those sorts of things. But eventually I had to get out of the fossil fuel business. And um, I had one interesting opportunity at the University of Melbourne where we did research on a number of different projects, but one of those was home economics. And I had done some volunteering in the, the space of um, helping people with their homes with the Bayside Climate Change Action Group or, or with Beyond Zero Emissions when they published their uh, buildings report. So I did some volunteering there, but at University of Melbourne, we worked out just how much money people could save by uh, getting their homes off gas heating with air conditioners rather than using gas heating. So uh, that was kind of a, a remarkable finding and it's led to the rest of the things that I'll be telling you about tonight, which is how these days as a home energy consultant, I'm helping people to get their homes off gas, be more comfortable, do all those things. Um, we had a good story to tell out of University of Melbourne about how much money people could save. But, uh, and we got a little bit of media, but those things come and go. And then it's like, well, how do you continue to spread the message? And one of my kids told me about Facebook. So about seven years ago, it was we started the Facebook group, which is now known as My Fish and Electric Home. And I think we've got something like 50, more than 57,000 members now. We've got nearly 100 people a day joining My Fish and Electric Home. So this is a place where people can get together and help each other to improve their, their homes. There's quite a robust discussion. And I thank the other six admins that are helping me out from around the country because it's uh, quite a big, big discussion that's going on now there. But you can see some of the testimonials we've had, like Jackie from Canberra, she's using her reverse cycle air conditioner to heat her home and uh, will be saving $1,100 instead of using the gas. So these are the case study after case study after case study we're seeing with people doing the, the little things, maybe changing some light bulbs or doing the bigger things where they've completely remodeled the house and, uh, and got it off gas and are, are more comfortable. So um, thanks again to Renew for organizing this. And when I'm talking with my home energy clients, I always tell them about Renew and I tell them about Renew Magazine and Sanctuary Magazine. And it is just such a great resource for people to find information, uh, both in these magazine forms or even on the, the YouTube channel. And just today, I had a client in Beaumaris, and um, they've just texted me to say uh, thanks for the help today, but also they've just joined Renew. So uh, usually when I visit a client's home, I take a suitcase along and it's full of Renew magazines. And we might, uh, we might focus on the, the hot water buying guide or the heating buying guide or the insulation buying guide, but those are all very useful uh, information for people. And these are the the sorts of topics that I talk to people about and we'll be talking about tonight. This graphic comes from the book Energy Freedom Home put together by Richard Keach, a colleague of mine for Beyond Zero Emissions. And uh, you can see that uh, graphic there, lighting, draft proofing, insulation, windows, and so forth and so on. So those are all the, the topics you can talk about uh, in a home with someone who, who wants to be more comfortable and get off gas and make their home more environmentally uh, a better performer. So that's also a very good resource, um, the Energy Freedom Home, if you want to uh, see information on all these things. And from that book, Richard Keech's house was one of the first case studies we had of a home that uh, got off gas. And you can see this chart here, which starts in 2006. The red shows the gas that Richard's house, this, uh, this weatherboard in Essendon, the, the red shows the gas that, uh, that his house used in 2006, and the blue shows the electricity. And you can see over the course of time leading up to 2012, Richard did various things, improving insulation, improving windows, improving draft proofing, um, perhaps uh, got a newer refrigerator or new lighting, that sort of thing. But in 2012, he then took the final step to uh, heat his house with air conditioners, heat his water with a, a heat pump, cook with the induction cooktop. And you can see that um, the gas was gone. And remarkably, the amount of electricity used in 2012 wasn't a much more electricity than was used in 2006. So as I say, this was one of the early case studies of what people can do to um, improve their homes, get them off gas, and yet don't really see much uh, in terms of the, the electricity use even increasing. And this is all without the solar panels. So everybody always likes to talk about solar panels as the first thing to do. Well, if it's the last thing you to, that you do, then you can make that electricity use that you see there with Richard's house, house at the end. Uh, you can net zero that off with uh, the production from your solar panels. So um, the organizers tonight 
did ask me to try to quickly go over a top 10. Um, for people that will look at this uh, as a recording later, you can slow this down maybe and, and have a look at e each of these individual top 10s. But uh, the first few do have to do with uh, getting your house off gas. But we'll also cover the things having to do with the thermal envelope of the home, insulation, draft proofing, moisture management, uh, windows and drapes and blinds. And, uh, and then I'll get out of the way for the other speakers because uh, you could certainly go on, on all night about any of these topics. So the number one, particularly as we come toward winter, is to heat with your air conditioner. A lot of people ha already have air conditioners in their homes, but they've not really found the heat button. <clears throat> so this is message number one. The research we did at University of Melbourne found that you could heat your house for about a third the cost uh, of gas if you've got an air conditioner. So air conditioners around the world uh, elsewhere are known as heat pumps because what they're able to do is using the refrigerant system, they can go outside and they can collect free heat from the air outside your house um, using the very cold refrigerant, but then the refrigerant goes through a compressor, gets very hot, hot enough to heat your house. And uh, that heat comes into the house and uh, the inside unit is able to transfer the, the heat from the refrigerant. So this cycle goes round and round. Yes, you do have to put some electricity into an air conditioner for heating. Uh, to function as a heat pump, but um, for every one part of electricity you might put into the air con, you can get uh, up to five parts of heat coming out of it. So you could say this device is 500% efficient, which beats gas uh, quite easily because gas might be at best 70% efficient or maybe 50% efficient. When you buy gas, the first thing you do is set it on fire and a lot of the heat goes up the chimney. Uh, so with gas, you're going downhill, whereas if you're using these uh, heat pumps, these reverse cycle air conditioners, they uh, can be remarkably uh, efficient and effective. This was some of the media that we got back in 2015. Heat pump technology could save Victorian homes up to $658 a year. And we're, we're still seeing these sorts of savings. In fact, the savings are probably even growing because as we all know, globally, the price of gas has just gone through the roof again, considering the events in Russia and Ukraine. So there's never been a time to get your home off gas. Um, this is an article that I wrote up and had published in Renew Magazine, which talks about uh, at our house, where we had heated the, the, the house with ducted gas for years and years, we finally got a couple air conditioners, put them in either end of the house. And uh, that's what we use for heating now at a third the cost of gas. So I need to make the point that the air con heating, um, it's, I don't actually call it electric heating. I call these other things on the chart here electric heating. You see all these other resistive electric heaters, whether it's a, a Nobo panel heater or an oil column heater or a fan heater. These all operate just like toasters. The electricity goes in there, heats up some wires, and then that can heat up your house. But it'll cost maybe five times what it is to run an air conditioner. Whereas an air conditioner is a heat pump and it's able to get free heat from, from outside. So, um, uh, some people um, get, get a bit of confusion between what they can do with an air conditioner versus these other forms of heating. In fact, I've been in homes where people have had both of these sorts of heating or maybe even the gas as well and they're, and they're making the wrong choice. <laughs> they think gas might be good. They think these other uh, electric heaters might be good and they think the air conditioners are the devil. So we need to be changing that thinking and educating people that air conditioners can actually be the cheapest way to go for heating your house. Uh, better than these electric systems, better than using gas. And if you are lucky enough to have solar PV on your roof, then this can work even better, at least during sunlight hours, uh, or even at night if you've got a battery, I, su I suppose. But uh, during sunlight hours, if you're generating electricity, like on a winter day, and if you choose to turn on your aircon for heating so that it can go get free rene renew renewable heat from outside the house, why well, this is about the cheapest heat that you can find. So that's, uh, that's what we need, need to be moving toward. But there is one little caveat. Uh, air conditioners have filters in them. And other ducted heating systems have filters. Ducted gas heating should have a filter in it. Clean those filters. Uh, many people, um, homes I visit, they don't really understand the air conditioner. No one's told them that there's a filter in there. So someone might have bought a house and it had the air conditioners there already. They've been in the house for five years. And they've never cleaned them. They have no idea if the previous owner ever cleaned them and we can open them up and see pictures like this. So um, any piece of equipment's probably gonna require some maintenance. So get the owner's manual, read through it and figure out what maintenance needs to be done. 
So that's, uh, that's heating with your heat pump. You can also heat your hot water with a heat pump. So this shows um, that situation where we've got a hot water heat pump. Again, the, the refrigerant system collecting free heat from the air and putting it into your water. Uh, that shown there is the sand and brand of heat pump that comes in two pieces, but there's other sorts of heat pumps that all come in one piece where the air conditioner bit is on top of the hot water. <clears throat> now these work really good with the solar PV again, if you happen to have solar on the roof, because what you can do is to set these up with timers or they'll have timers inbuilt that they uh, might be activated say at 11 o'clock in the morning when you're most likely to have electricity available to you from your solar panels. And so you can run your uh, heat pump here, your hot water heat pump for a couple hours to heat all the water. And this uh, is far, far cheaper uh, than gas. So without the solar, again, it's about a third the cost. Uh, the, the hot water is about a third the cost of what you could get with a gas heater. Um, but if you're using your solar electricity, well, then it's uh, is even cheaper than that. This graphic here shows our solar system on a day when we probably weren't home. Um, and so you can see our electricity usage in the middle of the night, but then the sun comes up, which is that gray part of the chart. And then you see that yellow bump down the bottom. That was when our hot water heat pump would have switched on. Say it's a noon, it looks like, and ran for an hour or two to, to uh, heat up the water. So when we finally did get home, there'd be lots of hot water there. So that's the way that uh, hot water heat pumps can, can work on a beautiful January day that was. And here's a graph, since not every, not every day is January or not every day has excellent sun, um, there are other days where your electricity production won't be that great, but still it may well be enough to power a hot water heat pump, which is using less than a thousand watts, less than a hairdryer. So even on a bad solar day, that's, that's what that curve can look like. So that's heating and hot water, um, cheaper to do it with heat pumps than using gas. And usually the third gas item in the home is the, uh, the cooktop. So this shows our home where we're doing a bit of wok cooking or I should probably more accurately say that my wife is doing some wok cooking there on our induction heat, uh, our induction cooker. So that's the third thing you have to do to, to get off gas is to get over to the electric cooking. Now, some people even um, don't mind using the electric resistive or the so-called ceramic, ceramic cooktops. These aren't induction. Um, they're just, again, wires getting hot underneath the surface. Um, so that's another form of electric cooking that some people um, use. But the induction is, is the one that is very quick. As soon as you turn it on, uh, the induction current turns the pot into the actual heating element. And so the, the water in the pot almost immediately starts to boil. Whereas with the ceramic systems, those can take longer to heat up and uh, longer to adjust and longer to cool down. But uh, just to uh, show the difference there in the cooktops. So, um, okay, you've got your home off gas. So let's ring up the gas company and say, um, we don't want a gas bill anymore and we don't even want a gas meter. So this is what people are doing. They're having their gas meters disconnected and uh, in a number of cases taken right off the property. So this is uh, how you get your home off gas. And that's what we've been calling for. That's what Renew's been calling for. And uh, these days you even see Choice Magazine talking about the all electric home and you even see the Victorian government talking about the all electric home. And you even see AGL, uh, the crowd that uh, sells electricity and gas. Um, they're also saying that people would be better off not using gas in their homes because it's a waste. Any gas you're using in your house is an economic waste because you've got cheaper options. Um, and so the billions of dollars we're spending burning gas in buildings is basically a waste. We don't have to do that anymore. And it's just a matter of time to see how quickly we can switch, how quickly we can spread the word, how quickly people can make the changes needed to get their homes off gas. So that's one way to um, be comfortable in uh, heating your house in a more affordable way using the air conditioners. But our homes are leaky buckets. And so as soon as we put heat into them, it, it, we don't live in thermos bottles. So as soon as we put heat into our house, it is going to try to, to leak out through the walls or through the windows through the floor, through the roof space. <clears throat> and so this is things we want to pay attention to, insulation, draft ceiling, window treatments. Uh, this shows insulation. And the most common thing I th see in people's homes is I'll go crawl up in the roof space and uh, there's actually insulation up there, but somebody's strewn it all around. Someone went up to change a light bulb. Someone went up to install the NBN. Someone went up to fix a water leak. So they move the insulation out of the way and they don't put it, put it back. 
So uh, if it's safe to do so at your house, if you haven't looked in your roof space for a while, I'd suggest having a look up there and see if the insulation you have is in the right place. And, uh, and also if you have enough of it. So it, it might be time for even topping up insulation. That's the roof space. Insulation in the walls is possible. Here you see a company Enviroflex blowing insulation into our weatherboard wall. Uh, it's a fiberglass material. They can blow that in. And under floor insulation can be retrofitted as well if you've got access underneath the floor. Uh, draft proofing. Now this can be one of the easier thing, things to be done DIY and, and renters can even attempt some of these things without having to do anything that would disturb a landlord. But uh, gaps under the doors, the wall vents, um, uh, gaps around architraves, uh, the evaporative cooling. The evaporative cooling is a good way to lose a lot of heat up through those evaporative cooling vents. So close those up one way or the other. Uh, over at My Fish and Electric Home, there's a million different tips as to ways to accomplish this draft proofing. So this is very important. We use that lose so much heat uh, just because our homes are leaky. But as we tighten up our homes, um, one thing you should do, particularly if you're still using gas heaters, is to check that the gas heaters aren't putting out poisonous carbon monoxide. Um, maybe the only thing that's keeping you alive in your house right now is because it's so leaky. Um, so get rid of the gas heater or have, have it checked, make sure it's not uh, producing carbon monoxide, uh, and then you can tighten up your house. But you also then have to manage moisture um, because as we tighten up our houses, maybe in the old days, all any moisture in the house would just leak out through the you know, cracks around the windows or what have you. But in a tighter house, you have to manage moisture. You have to run the extraction fan at the cooktop, run the extraction fans in the bathroom. Uh, and do not hang laundry around the house to dry. I know this is a practice a lot of people do. Um, sure, hang your clothes outside, that's fine, or on a veranda, but don't hang it in the house to dry because it can be liters and liters of water coming out of out of that uh, laundry to, to do who knows what, seep through your plaster and then grow mold in the, in the fiberglass insulation perhaps. These days there's a technology called the heat pump condensing clothes dryer, which I uh, highly recommend for clothes drying. Maybe Renew Magazine should even do an article on clothes drying at one point. Uh, windows and window treatments. Of course, um, we, we lose heaps of, of heat out the windows and there's lots of things you can do there either as a DIY using things like even bubble wrap or or cardboard if you're desperate enough, um, or some of these cling films, but uh, also the um, heavy drapes and uh, window treatments are important things, and then, then use them. So I, I go into a number of homes where they've got a lot of blinds and drapes and curtains, but they don't even bother to use them, and, uh, and then they're uncomfortable in their lounge room at night. So they can be very effective things to keep a lot of heat in. So uh, that's that's about it. I'm happy to get involved with the Q&A and I'm very interested to see what the, uh, our other pre presenters have to say tonight. Um, this winter, heat with your air conditioner. That's a main message. Thank you very much. Thank you, great. Great. Um, our next speaker is going to be Matt Piper. Matt and his staff uh, bought a house in the 1970s, in a 1970s house in Reservoir which had gas appliances and no insulation. They both had little DIY experience. So with help from some friends and family, they now have a very comfortable home, a thriving garden um, using on-site tanks, and they don't pay any power bills. So Matt, I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Rob. I'll just share my screen. Perfect. Okay, so my partner Steph and myself are ready to settle down in Melbourne after a few years of adventures around Australia. We're looking forward to an affordable home in Melbourne that we could call our own. After many months of looking, we found a home in Reservoir that home buyers and developers had seemingly overlooked. It failed to sell at its two previous auctions. It was certainly a little, little rough around the edges. Um, it wasn't even a regular shaped block. However, the house itself is compact and something we could work with. So we bought it and we moved in. We hit the ground running with our first big improvement being the uh, solar system, which is north facing. So we get a fairly good production um, all year round. And that costs, yeah, four and a half thousand dollars. 
who transformed the feel of the home after renovating the kitchen and the bathroom and a fresh coat of paint. So that's the bathroom there, the main bathroom, the big one. Almost all the windows were single glazed aluminium. All right, there we go. Um, almost all the single glazed aluminium windows in the house were either broken or didn't open or both. So we took the opportunity to upgrade all the windows and doors to UPVC windows and the doors from Ultimate Windows. The installers installed ensured all the units were correctly sealed to provide maximum performance. So that was a fairly big expense at $25,000. But um, they're tilt and turn, so um, you can have them open um, tilted uh, with the built-in fly stream, which means you don't get any bugs in, but you still get the nice airflow, especially in Melbourne where we don't get um, too severe heat in summer and in the shoulder seasons as well. The new double glade door um, brings in so much north facing light into our home. And you can see our dog there enjoying it um, almost all year round. We converted the only east facing window into a nice light filled doorway entrance. It brings in wonderful morning light compared to the old very dark and drab uh, dining room. We needed a dog door for our dogs. So the most convenient way to have one was to just install one through the east facing external wall. It's just two cheap dog doors, one on each side of the external wall cavity. So they're just, um, yeah, quite happy with that solution. Um, we were looking for more expensive options, but this seemed to be quite a good middle ground. And it stops the draft as well, um, even in the windiest conditions. The lighting in the home needs to be upgrading almost immediately, if not for energy savings, but to stop my head from hitting the low hanging light fittings. Our ceilings are only 2.4 meters. Um, I'm not huge, but I still managed to hit my head on um, that chandelier in that photo. Um, the low ceilings do help with heating and cooling, but it also means we don't have the luxury of installing ceiling fans. And then there's a gas heater in that room as well. And here's a result. So we've got our newly installed um, air conditioning unit on the top right hand side there and our, um, yeah, the, the old gas heater has been removed from the middle of that photo. We removed the original wall between the kitchen and the living room to modernize the living spaces. It was a load bearing wall, so it cost around $10,000 to remove. We kept the doors connected to the hallway so the living spaces can be zoned off for winter heating, which is what we're doing tonight. So we're only heating the lounge room kitchen and dining room. And that's, um, that's more than enough space for our little um, air conditioning unit to heat um, on a winter's night. And it brings in lovely light um, from the north. During the renovation, we paid close attention to correctly laying out existing insulation and topping up with the mostly donated insulation um, that we found mostly off marketplace. We also ensured to repair any leaks created from rotting timber around skirting boards and other penetrations um, in the home, which made a huge difference. The existing evaporative air conditioning unit has been good for Melbourne at the moment, but still struggles in hot and humid days, which we're gonna have more in the, in the future. The unit is very cheap to run for the whole house. Next summer, we're gonna be relying on our split system a lot more and it's more efficient. And the plan is to remove. The plan is to remove that um, evaporative uh, into the future. So we um, removed a, we removed two gas heaters, one in the kitchen and then another in the lounge room. We've installed a five kilowatt 
they can split system and they've been, oh, that unit has proved um, very efficient and very comfortable. We don't run the heating until we get um, deeper into winter. And on, sunny, on a sunny winter day, our house warms up nicely from the sun with our backyard being north and we get a lot of sun into the study kitchen and lounge room. So that's with the cost around $3,000 to install, um, but it's gonna be a lot cheaper to run all year and a lot more efficient. We insulated all external walls, which is easy to do with external single brick veneer. It's made a huge difference as we lived in the home all our lives, oh, as we lived in homes all our lives that were drafty and difficult to keep at the desired temperature. After a year of living in the home without any meaningful insulation, this particular upgrade has made, has made the house extremely comfortable. So we researched um, different installers and we ended up going with Enviroflex. So it cost around three and a half thousand dollars, but they were one of the only ones in Melbourne who were um, able to do blow in external uh, insulation to the wall cavity. And we've also topped up insulation under the floor and in the ceiling. That was a DIY job, but the external wall we couldn't do ourselves and it wasn't practical to remove plaster internally after we just painted. So it was a good option, a good retrofit. And it's, um, it's sealed up. Um, yeah, they did a really good job. A local council of Darwin allows verge gardens to be planted. So we made the most of our 33 meter long nature strip and there's no concrete footpath in our court. We decided to grow a large amount of produce, which is all watered by 10,000 litres of combined um, water tanks, all running off our roofs. We've also focused on planting vegetation that will attract native wildlife to our garden. So we've just started to finish the harvest of our fajoas from our, from our tree. That's Steph, my wife and our dog, admiring them. Along the way, it's been a joy to see the garden be transformed from grass to a flowing native garden. Everyone appears to enjoy the outdoor spaces we've created, including the bees there as well. And we've got a stormwater, um, a grey water um, ponds, which are just old bathtubs there on the left-hand side. So that waters from our, um, our ensuite, and it just flows through a filtration system and then goes down into the garden to provide um, a little bit of water all year round. With our solar system, we are producing far more than we are consuming as we're just a two person household. We still have gas hot water that we are in the process of replacing with a more efficient heat pump unit to make better use of our solar PV. So that's just a graph of our production and our consumption. So we're definitely producing a lot more over the summer months and even into winter, we've been um, able to produce a lot more energy than we use in the house. So that's that green bar there is how much we're producing. And then the yellow bar is how much we're consuming. And we've got a decent feed in at the moment with our solar system, but again, we're not using that much power because we've cut down um, our usage. So <clears throat> we've got a power power, which is a free um, energy monitoring system. Uh, most of the day, my partner and I are still working from home. So we're able to create all our own power to run our house. We've gotten very good at low shifting energy that, um, that's high, high power, like cooking, cleaning, running dishwasher and washing machines at times where we have adequate solar production. We use, the solar, um, we use our solar system a lot to make the most of it. So that's just the power power. So it shows that we actually don't, um, don't consume any power from the grid uh, during daylight hours on a, on a regular day, which is good. We end up only paying around $1.50 a day um, for power as we don't have a battery yet. We are very happy with how this relatively cheap innovation has turned out. We've only been in the house for under two years we have spent around $75,000 um, to transform this three bedroom uh, property that nobody wanted into a very attractive 
very attractive and comfortable home. So we're very happy that we did this quite quickly and now we can enjoy the benefits. And that's all we've got to talk about our house. That was very impressive, Mountain staff. Wow. I'm uh, very impressed with the amount of work you've done and how quickly you've done it. Well done. Yeah. yeah. Lost and helped. <laughs> yes. And I'm sure we'll get lots of questions at the end. But I'll now pass over to Peter, or who's going to be the, our next speaker. He's an NBN engineer and has been always very keen on tackling climate change. Uh, so at home, he's a family of three and they've changed their 1908 Edwardian home to becoming all electric and installing an 8.2 kilowatt solar PV system. So the home now is uh, warm in winter and cool in summer and very cheap to run. So Peter, maybe you can tell us a bit more about it. Um, look, thank you to Renew for the opportunity to speak this, this evening. Um, uh, I guess my story is uh, similar but different to the, the, the presentation from, from the previous speakers. Um, uh, for those that uh, are regular readers of Renew, um, you'll note that th this evening's presentation is based on and builds on an article that I published in uh, uh, July 19 in Renew magazine, which was sort of the, the formative stages of our, our conversion, um, uh, showing sort of uh, you know, one year prior to a con the conversion and one year after, um, where we still had some, some gas elements left in our house, but um, sort of showed the, I guess, the progress to date. Um, what this presentation now completes is actually the, the full conversion to the point uh, where we, we no longer have any gas. Um, uh, so there's a picture of our house um, on a lovely blue sunny day in uh, late spring. Um, uh, what you'll note there is there's a little bit of a, a dead patch on the grass there, which I'll come back to in a moment. Um, it's significant uh, as part of this story. Oops, and okay. Oh, come on. There we go. Okay. Um, so as, uh, as introduced, uh, our house was built in 19, 1908, um, which was actually around the time that um, the, the North Melbourne Electric Tramways and Lighting Company was contracted to build uh, the electric tramway to, to Mooney Ponds Junction. Um, it didn't only include the, the, the construction of electricity for uh, you know, lighting and, um, and, and the tramway itself, it also included the electrification of uh, the houses in the area, and I suspect um, given the timing of that, which was around 1905, that our house has always had uh, some form of ele you know, electricity connected to it, probably starting with uh, electric lighting. Um, as you can see, it's, it's, um, it's a house in two parts. Uh, the front part is the, the original 1908 Edwardian, uh, largely, largely in its, its, its original form. Um, and then the rear part um, has been subject to a, a, a sort of a mid 90s uh, extension with a quite a large flat roof there, which you can see, see our solar panels on. Um, the total internal area is about 180 square meters. Each part is, 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 is roughly 90 square meters. Uh, and as you can see that the flat roof area sort of encompasses an, an open plan sort of dining and living kitchen area. Uh, the study that I'm sitting in at the moment, a laundry, and then um, we've got sort of three bedrooms and a bathroom. Um, for our family of three uh, in, in, in the older part of the house underneath uh, the sloped roof uh, that you can see there. Um, it's worth highlighting also in, in this picture, um, I guess the utility side of our house, which is down the right hand side here uh, in this Google Earth image, um, you can sort of see there's, there's three water tanks there. You can see the top of a hot water heat pump. You can see the top of an air conditioner and also you can see the top of our, our high hydronic heating system. Um, they're details that I go into in, in more in, in, with, with more information in just a moment, but just to give you some context as to where they sit and, and, and uh, um, how they've been sort of physically located uh, around our house. Um, the, the rooms that themselves that are regularly heated um, uh, are obviously the, the dining and living area. Um, and then the, the two bedrooms on the left-hand side are, are also heated um, the, and the hallway. We tend to not heat the bathroom. There's no heating in the laundry, and, and this study, which is sort of quite a self-contained area, doesn't doesn't really need much heating at all. Um, that the, the the guest bedroom, as we call it, on the front right there, is tends not to be heated unless it's unless required. Um, so our, our household energy journey uh, from our, our time of purchase in 2008 um, 
you can see there, you know, basically what we started with, um, and and I guess the characteristics of the house were were, were not unusual, I guess, for a, a mid '90s sort of renovation in, uh, in terms of what was installed. Um, you know, the, the the usage of gas for the hot water, the usage of gas for for a hydronic a boiler, a, quite a large boiler, I might add, at 30, around 38 kilowatts. Um, uh, you know, there was some amount of of uh, of uh, uh, insulation um, put in up in the ceiling space. Um, fortunately, insulation put in uh, into into the wall space. Um, but look, strangely enough, and you know, even though we had a, a, a an archi centre sort of report uh, done on the property be before we purchased it, for, for everything that's in in this report, um, and I guess the very physical things that it told us about the house that uh, needed attending to, which wasn't too bad, uh, the house overall, overall and structurally was 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 in, in pretty good shape. Uh, interestingly, the Archie Centre report just makes no mention of anything to do with, with energy efficiency, no mention of, of uh, drafts, no mention of insulation, no mention of any sort of energy efficiency from a, a, an appliances perspective. Um, these are all things that we sort of, I guess, then subsequently discovered having, having lived in the house. Um, so prior to 2016, um, um, we, you know, I guess there were things that we, we did um, to att attend to the basics. Um, th that included, you know, sort of some some basic sort of draft draft ceiling um, using sort of things that you might uh, purchase from from Bunnings. Um, we did some uh, replacement of uh, incandescent globes with uh, uh, CFL globes. You know, these these funny sort of circular round things that probably people are, are quite familiar with. Um, there was a lot of halogen globes uh, throughout the place. Um, I, I replaced those, uh, keeping the keeping the, the, the fittings and, and just uh, replacing those again with things that you buy from, from Bunnings, but an LED equivalent. Um, during that time, we did find that the hot water panel, the solar hot water panel on the roof was, was broken. It lost all its uh, glyco out of it. So the, uh, the, the hot water system really wasn't getting any, any benefit of uh, solar radiation. Um, our, our air conditioner, I guess, was the, the first main appliance to fail and, and I guess one of the, the bigger decisions that uh, we had to make during that period. Um, we expanded it from a, uh, a single unit operating in the land room to a, a four-way split system, um, you know, occupying the, the same footprint at the end of the day, but uh, providing sort of cooling into, into other areas of, of the house. Um, I guess one of the things we did at the time also was that given we had an, a hydronic heating system, it, um, we, we decided that it wasn't worth over investing in, in, a, in, a, in a heat pump air conditioning system that did heating as well. And um, we saved in the order of, um, uh, I think it was around $1,000 uh, as a result of getting a, a cooling only system at the time. Um, what that did do though, is, is lock us into, um, I guess, uh, you know, when, when the, the heating system was, was reaching at the end of its life, um, uh, you know, a, a continuation of the hydronic system, which uh, I I'm, you know, I must say we're, we're very pleased with, but um, it, it, it did sort of narrow our choices already at that point, um, which uh, maybe in hindsight, we, we might've made different choices. Um, um, we also tried basic draft proofing um, with all, all the strips and, and, and basic corking, um, exhaust fan hats and things like that. If people put those on top of their exhaust fans in their bathrooms, I guess an experience for me is when when you open the bathroom door, you should hear a click of the hat open and close as, as the pressure changes as you walk through. If you don't hear that click, then probably one of the flaps has fallen off, which has uh, happened to us and I've, I've had to fix it. Um, so be wary of those things that, um, that you know, you can install them and then they, that they stop working. Um, and then skylight covers as well. So just putting another layer underneath our skylights. Now, the, all the items in red are things that I'm gonna go into in more detail in, in, in subsequent slides. Um, uh, you know, for everything that we've done now to get to the point of no gas, there's a, a still a couple of things to go and, and there's sort of um, two side windows and a rear French opening door that uh, we're due shortly to upgrade to, uh, you know, double glazed, um, um, you know, modern style windows to replace the existing ones, which are, you know, on the verge of failing. Uh, and I guess on that note, I would highlight that, I guess of all the, the, uh, the structural problems we've had in the house, all of them have been in the, in the mid 1990s section of the house and the, the front part of the house, the original structure uh, has proven to be uh, you know, quite bomb proof in nature from a, a weather perspective and all those sorts of things. Um, the first thing I, I guess I, I would put to people um, uh, and is a, is a gateway really to any, any gas to electrical 
uh, conversion is, is making sure that you have a switchboard that's able to cater for uh, you know, added electrical loads, um, both in terms of uh, overall load um, in uh, for, for power, but also the number of uh, circuits that you need to be able to support. As you can see here, we, we had quite a small, you know, 12, 12, um, 12 module uh, switchboard previously, and that was uh, expanded to, to 24. Um, if, if you're looking to replace your, your, your faulty, uh, your, your hot water system uh, when it fails and you haven't uh, taken care of these, this sort of thing in the first place, um, there's no way you're gonna get a, a fast electrical replacement of, of your exis existing ga uh, failed gas unit because um, you know, this, this sort of thing takes time and, and takes money if, if that's what needs to be done first. So I do recommend doing that. Um, it did cost a few thousand dollars. And at the time that um, this was put in, we also had the electrical circuits run to the side of the house to support our heating systems and, uh, and, our, um, uh, and our hot water system. You can see here on, on, the, on the right hand side, there's one switch that's turned off um, uh, that, that was sitting there, I guess, waiting for our, our electrical stove and oven uh, to be converted uh, and was not uh, as yet connected. Um, so with our hot water, um, we went from a gas boost, boosted hot water, which was sort of a, a thing that probably a lot of people have sitting on, on the side of their house. It, it, it did work remarkably well for, for all the years that we did use it, but um, it, you know, I, I don't think very efficient at, at the end of the day, um, particularly when um, it was boosting the water from cold all the time using the, the, the solar panel that you can see up the top there. That big tank that you can see up there, which is, um, uh, I think it was a, a 300 litre tank, um, uh, is the thing that caused the, the, the brown patch on the grass out the front of our place. It sat there for a couple of days and killed the grass. Um, but if you sort of recall the size of that, that dead grass patch gives you an idea of just how big that thing is. And indeed, um, if you read into the details of the article from uh, 2019, um, you'll, you'll also read about the heartache and, and the effort and the difficulty we had getting that thing uh, removed off our roof. Um, you know, it, it, it come, you know, breaks down into three very cumbersome, complex, heavy parts to lip off a, a, a high, high sloping roof. And um, in the, at the end of the day, it involved a, a, a plumber, our high, hydronic heating designer, uh, Chris Siddons, um, and, and involved uh, the solar installers all, uh, all working uh, together to, to lower those parts off the roof. And it was uh, a, a big effort and a, and a, and a job that, I guess, again, was a, as a gateway to anything else happening. There was no way I wanted that left up there um, uh, whilst installing a whole bunch of new equipment underneath uh, for the risk of it, it, it coming down uh, at a later stage and causing lots of damage. Um, the, the hot water heat pump that we went to was a, a Bosch unit of 300 litres. Um, um, Tim pointed out sort of such similar units. Uh, I'll just point out why we chose that one in particular for that side of the house. As you can see, it's got quite a small footprint. It stands, uh, it's freestanding on its own. It doesn't attach to the house and, and uh, uh, drive any vibration uh, into the walls. Um, it also has an elevated heat pump sitting on top of it, which as you can imagine, uh, it's quite possible for cold trapped air to get stuck along that side of the house. And, and the, uh, the height of the unit keeps, keeps the heat pump operating uh, at, at out in a way of that, that cold trapped in and operating as efficiently as possible. Um, one last thing that I would hi highlight with that heat pump is it does have a, an external connector. Uh, as Tim suggested, putting a timer on, on your hot water service is, is useful um, uh, to, to sort of bias its, its consumption of, of your solar energy during sunny days. Um, uh, with, with a bit of effort, I, I managed to get uh, an external connector as just a wiring breakout box really at the end of the day from Bosch. Um, which has, a, as you can see, a PV plus and a PV minus connector. Um, connecting that across to our Fronis inverter made the hot water service solar aware. So it knew when, when we were generating electricity and, and um, it improved our use of, of solar energy uh, for hot water heating by uh, in the order of sort of 10 to 15% uh, just by the, the hot water service just being a bit smarter in, in regards to solar, of course. That says nothing whether all of that solar was being used already or not. So that's why sometimes it was still consuming grid energy. Um, our hydronic heating, as you can see, there's the, the big dirty old uh, 38 kilowatt gas boiler, um, uh, certainly reaching towards the end of its life. Um, you know, we, we spent a couple of hundred dollars having it serviced every couple of years, um, you know, cleaning the burners and things like that and replacing uh, expansion tanks. Um, it was certainly uh, you know, time for it to go um, when we, by the time we got to 2017. 
Um, it was replaced with um, what you can see there is a, a freestanding steel sand with uh, two um, uh, air to, to water uh, heat pumps, um, uh, each, each consuming two kilowatts of power, but uh, uh, generating uh, 3.5 kilowatts of, of heat. Um, they fed uh, the, the water circulating through the pipes into a, a hundred litre water tank that you can see underneath there. And you can see two, two little red pumps there, um, which uh, actually take the water out of the, the, the hot water buffer tank as it's called and circulate that through the house. Um, the pumps each service, um, uh, the, the, the front part of the house and, and the rear side of the house is one of the other things we had done was, was split uh, one, one very large a hydronic system into two parts um, where you know the, those two parts have quite different heating needs at different times of the day. Um, a, a key lesson that, that in retrospect we could have done better and differently is the blue part here where you can see there's two return paths we could have actually kept that and, and, and I sort of I keep myself when that I wasn't sort of keeping a better eye on what the plumber was doing because I, I think we, we could have saved a, a run of piping there and, and you know potentially some losses uh, in, the, in the system as a result. Um, I guess a, an important point to note with hydronic systems is that, you know, as, as much of our, our heat pumps uh, have a uh, coefficient of performance, Tim talked before about coefficients of performance of five, um, th these, these heat pumps have a 3.5 COP, um, but the system COP, which is everything, you know, includes, uh, you know, the, the standing losses in the tank and the losses in the pipes underneath the house, um, mean, we have a coefficient, overall system coefficient of performance of, of around two, which is, uh, you know, uh, you know, clearly not as efficient as as, as those uh, air source heat pumps that uh, um, both Matthew and, and Tim have been describing this evening. Um, so, but that's that's the nature of the hydronic system. Um, you can make Im improvements and reduce those losses by you know insulating, and and that's what you can see there. Um, the the two the two pumps have been wrapped up with uh, with uh, thermal sort of. Um, insulating tape that I bought from, uh, from Clark Rubber. Um, and we also judiciously had um, uh, the, the lagging installed on, on the pipes underneath the house. You can see the original sort of exposed copper there and, and this green sheathing that sort of sat on it that provided next to no insulation. Um, uh, we, we put lagging on this black lagging, split lagging on top of it, which you sort of peel off a strip and, and push it over and then, then stick it together. Um, for the most part, that worked really well. But uh, this green part actually makes the, the lagging sort of stretch and, sp and split a bit where the, where the seam is that sticks together. And so that's why you see the electrical tape here to sort of pull it back together um, because the, the, the sizing wasn't quite right. Uh, before I move off this slide, I'll just highlight one more thing. You can see this is the back side of a, a pair of uh, stairs as, as you go down on the inside of the house. And you can see that I've put some, uh, some uh, uh, sealant there because um, uh, there was a, a source of draft that was found there. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about solar, the solar PV installations. Most people know a lot about it. I would highlight though um, that uh, as you can see, we've covered most of that flat roof area. Um, the, the, the good coverage of those solar panels over the back roof actually do provide uh, a good shading uh, of that roof and, and the difference in temperature of, of the tin underneath the solar panels versus that the tin that's exposed directly to the sun is, is quite dramatic. Um, and and uh, it has uh, certainly improved the, um, the, how cool uh, that room stays uh, during the summer months because the, it's not directly exposed to that, that radiant heat from, from the roof. Um, I, I think there's an R2 equivalent sort of uh, insulations sitting in that roof, but there's not much uh, that, that we could do with it. Um, uh, something else to sort of highlight there is um, the, the Fronius inverter that we have has a, a digital I.O. controller there. Um, one of the pins uh, on that orange connector there um, is, is used to connect or was used to connect to our, our hot water service to, to tell it when uh, excess solar was being generated and, and there's programmatically you can change the settings on that. Um, there's a couple of other digital I.O. settings on, on the Fronius as well that allow you to uh, curtail and, um, uh, and cut back uh, the export load, and I'll come back to that in a moment as well. Um, so, of course, draft proofing, is, as Tim has pointed out, is, is, is very important. We had sort of, you know, some efforts to do with, you know, with, with sort of bunning sort of quality sort of draft proofing, and if people have had a play with that, those sorts of things uh, peel off very easily and, and, um, and you know, often don't do the job or stop the door from opening properly or stop the window from, you know, make a window stick. 
um, we, we ended up going with a, a, a product um, by uh, Eco, Eco Master, um, which are, are called Draft Dodges, and they're a very clever um, installation. You can see here on, on the edge of the door, these were pre-coloured white with a, with a, a white sort of um, uh, seal. Uh, these are, are casement windows with, with uh, you can see there's a, a wooden strip there. It, it looks like the original window when you look at it, but there's a brush seal there. And, and what I'm holding in my hand is, is you can see the brush. There's the peel off sticker there. And this is the space that you use to make sure you get it the, the, the correct distance away from the window to, to optimize the seal and, and, and the alignment uh, against the window, which, you know, as you might expect in an old house, um, things are, are never as straight as you, as, as you might expect. Uh, really fantastic products. Um, and there's others sort of similar to the, the Eco Masters out there as well. This is a this is the the, the, the rubber padding that, that goes in uh, up against the door, and as the door closes, um, you get a, a, a flush even sealed around the whole door there, which uh, works uh, very well. Um, there's the other side of the stairs. So behind that yellow line is where um, I, I, I put some uh, sealant, and you can see I sealed around the doors there, actually all the way along where the old part of the house met the new house uh, underneath the, the wall there. Uh, that there was a, a draft gap to be sealed up. Um, we found draft gaps are, uh, around um, uh, around uh, uh, sink pipes and things like that on, uh, underneath the you know in, in the cupboards there. I found a really interesting draft around the, the edge of the bath. I was sitting sat down on the edge of the bath one day with my hands down and felt this funny draft coming from from underneath the bath. Um, a draft behind the, the stove there, which I'm not sure whether it was deliberate or not because it was a gas stove. Again, a big draft there coming in from. Uh, the, the strip up against the wall, which uh, was sealed. Um, and then lastly, I, I made mention of, of these lights before, which were, were placed into the existing fittings. Um, as you can see these, as you might be able to see, they're, they're, they're a vented light. And, and like the halogens, um, you know, which needed ventilation because they, they got so hot, um, you know, are, are basically uh, air leaks in, into, your, into your ceiling space. And um, uh, typically uh, the installation does not go over these lights. And, and so as a result, You've, you've got holes in your insulation and, and places for that lovely warm air that you've generated uh, getting out into your ceiling space and going to waste. Um, we ended up doing another round of, of lighting upgrades and went with um, these uh, lovely apex uh, lights. Um, as you can see, they've got a big heat sink there. And one of the things that they are is, is IC4 rated, which allows you to put insulation straight over the top of them um, because there's no risk of fire there or anything like that. That said, when our, our, our new insulation was sort of finally put in, um, the, the installers did still were, were risk, risk averse to uh, putting insulation over those, 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 those lights. And it was something I had to go back and, and do afterwards. Um, now I've said insulate your ceiling last is because um, there's a lot of electrical work um, that, that sometimes needs to go on up in your ceiling space as part of your, your gas to electric conversion. And there's no point, as Tim pointed out, uh, having all that lovely insulation laid down, put down so neatly, and then the first electrician that goes up there uh, uh, wrecks it all for you. So in our case, it was one of the last things that was done. As you can see, there's the some air conditioning pipes that were run up there, but we had the electricals for, for the, the, the hot water and, and the heating run through the roof. There was a, uh, for, the, uh, for the thermostat for the heating, which I've got here as wireless, there was a, a, a connection up on the roof as well. Um, so only after all of that, um, did we put the insulation in. And what you can see here is, uh, these are just, I, I call them crawl boards, but there were boards that allowed me to sort of move, move across the, the, the ceiling space there safely without sort of pushing too much out of place uh, to put that insulation uh, in on top of those lights uh, at the end of it all. Um, one of the last and maybe the hardest things to convert was, was, was our gas stove. It was an 80 centimetre uh, gas stove, very hard to find a one for one replacement. The aesthetic sort of element to it as well, which made it very hard as you can see. Uh, we've had some cabinetry built and um, you know, we've got an induction stove top and oven there and gained some nice uh, uh, drawer and, and cupboard space as a result of that. Um, it, it was potentially a, a risk that we we're going to renovate the whole kitchen at one stage, but I think I've come up with a, a, a good alternative that indeed looks, uh, looks much better than the original. Uh, data is very important. Um, you can see here's the, the full set of data from when our, our solar was installed. I'm not going to go through the details here, but you can sort of see in around the um, March 2020 timeframe, we had our, our solar analytics device up, upgraded to a six channel device, which allowed us to see not just the blue in, in the hot water, uh, but then uh, start seeing uh, heating and cooling, which is the red. Um, and and uh, we also purchased an electric vehicle at the time. So the, the green is, is the energy consumed by electric, our electric vehicle. Of course, all of that period is, is through COVID times. 
uh, and as much as you can sort of see a very consistent uh, energy consumption there, uh, generation there as a result of our solar, uh, you can see the ups and downs of uh, energy being consumed uh, through the different seasons, which um, you know, winter is, is obviously counter to when, when the most solar is being generated and if only we could seasonally shift um, that energy. Um, expanding on the, the data inside Renew, um, we've got 2016 and 2018 data. Um, uh, I've broken it down in this chart here into uh, where the source is. So um, uh, blue is, is a gas source from the grid, brown is, is electricity source from the grid. Um, with the solar install, we then ended up with um, uh, uh, obviously on-site renewables generation, the orange, which we consumed ourselves and, and the yellow underneath is, is what was being exported. You can see a, a shift in time uh, to the most recent complete year 2021, where our, our self-consumption has, has increased substantially uh, from 22% from up to 45%. That's particularly as a result of charging our car using the solar off our roof. Um, during COVID times, we, we've ended up consuming about an extra megawatt hour of electricity as well. Um, uh, which uh, is shown in the complete stack here. So just a, a bit of an increase across the board. I guess the interesting thing to note about 2021, the blue uh, being, being cooling energy, uh, how I guess mild our summer was uh, through, through the last season uh, compared to other seasons, but uh, there's probably some impact there of our improved uh, insulation. Um, in all, um, since installation, we've generated 50 megawatt hours of electricity and the system is on the verge of paying for itself um, uh, for $9,900 install costs. Um, uh, we've, we've had benefit of uh, you know, both the fit, but particularly consuming our own energy um, of $8,700 uh, to date. In terms of costs, um, you know, gas has gone up, so goodness knows what, if we still had that gas infrastructure today, how much it would be costing us, but we've gone from around $2,600 in, in utility bills, uh, gas and electricity um, down to $1,644. Uh, I've backed out the, the, the EV charges there, both in terms of the grid consumption and also uh, what the vehicle might have otherwise consumed um, or sacrificed in fit, um, just so we've got compare, able to compare between the two. Um, this was pre, of course, uh, when, the, when the stove was connected in, in March this year. So this year will look very different. There won't be any gas segments there. There's about $350 worth of gas costs, which would buy around one4 uh, megawatt hours of electricity um, based on our, our uh, gas electric stove usage today. It's about an average of a kilowatt hour a day. So um, I'm expecting we'll save another couple of hundred dollars per annum off that, that $16.44 um, uh, as a result of, of now going all electric. Um, I would highlight we're also 100% green power and have been for a very long time. Uh, there was no doubt back in previous years a significant premium to uh, purchasing uh, green power at 7.3 7 cents and 8.6 cents per kilowatt hour on top of normal energy. Um, what it does mean though, in, um, together with the offset gas that we've got, um, that we are you know, carbon neutral from, a, from an energy perspective. Um, uh, one thing that has changed in, in the last years since we've had the electric vehicle where we were a net electric or electricity generator, um, we're, we're now consuming a bit more than that because of um, you know, the, the, the rough uh, three and a half megawatt hours that is consumed by our vehicle uh, each year. Um, Quick point to highlight, documentation is so important. Uh, collect it together. If you can't find it, then um, you know, you, the tradespeople at Visit will be making it up and having to re-explore and waste time looking for it. It's also an invaluable tool to be passing on to the next owner of your house. Um, electrical systems tend to be a bit more technically complex and not having that documentation to pass on to the others, I think you would be doing um, them a, a disservice. Um, uh, in, in particular, I guess I, I brought this together because of COVID times and I'm thinking, well, if, if, if I don't pull all this together, then uh, who, who that comes after me uh, is going to know um, how, how, to, how to operate my house in, unless um, it's, it's, it's sitting um, in an ordered way. Um, next steps, um, we're, we're, we're now getting smart with our energy. So you know, today we've been focused on maintaining our household comfort, comfort maximising the use of our solar and minimising cost. But now we want to be grid and renewables friendly and switching to amber. Um, I'm now introducing sort of systems that are uh, built on uh, what's called the home assistant platform, allows us to control and shift uh, our loads and also control the output from our, our, our solar PV uh, based on, on the fit cost. So if the fit goes negative, for example, which it can do, um, that we are able to sort of curtail load from output from our inverter um, and trying to be um, you know, a, a friend to the renewable grid at the end of the day, rather than acting counter to it. 
Um, likewise, when, when um, general prices are high, um, we, we, cut, we cut our load. And um, uh, when prices are low, of course, that's a, an opportune time, not just when the sun's shining for me to be charging my car and the car's not always home when, when the, sun, the sun's shining. Um, but if, if there's 10 cents a kilowatt hour in the middle of the night, uh, because the wind's blowing uh, out in Gippsland, um, I'll take that very much and, and, and put it into my car. Um, so I, I could, there's a whole other presentation in, in, in this. Um, it's, it's very much a learning experience and, and the, sort of the, the latest thing that I've been working on here. Um, but um, you know, smart energy, I think, is the, is the way we need to go eventually. As much as this is a, a tinkering exercise for me, I think you know, five years or ten years down the track, you know, that you know, our homes being smart and inter being in more integrated with the renewable grid is going to be so important. Um, in conclusion, look, Tim's made a lot of these points, you know, around gas. You know, yes, it it, it, it may be cheap and and, and cheap cheap um, compared to the price of electricity uh, per kilowatt hour. Um, it's also cleaner on a per kilowatt hour but, uh, than gas, but you know that doesn't include the fugitive losses from from the mining and distribution. Um, um, you know, gas is going up in price, and I'm sure that the, the, the cost that I, I was paying back in 2016 would be exorbitantly more now. Uh, importantly, you can't generate your own gas. Um, having solar panels on on your roof um, means uh, means you can generate your own energy, and the more you use, um, the, the the more money you'll save. Um, you can buy carbon offsets for gas, but really that's a band-aid measure at the end of the day. And those carbon offsets are something that, that we as an economy need to apply to other things that, that, that can't easily be substituted by uh, electrical systems. Um, a, a really big point that I'd like to stress is that you know, gas is a household air pollutant. Um, the uh, Better Health Channel and the big government recently published an update on safety issues with gas heating and the importance of getting uh, your gas appliances regularly serviced um, and how... Uh, you know, the risks of uh, carbon monoxide poisoning as well. If you haven't had your unit of service soon, please um, do that. Um, so look, in conclusion, you know, the gas to electrical conversion is, you know, both financially and environmentally friendly, uh, even with an old weatherboard house with poor thermal mass, you know, you can still be a net energy generator and be low and no carbon for energy. Um, you know, our big success has, has come about recently and to add to Tim's pictures there, uh, we've lost our meter. And uh, actually those pipes have completely gone down that's been disconnected down the streets. So one, one more to count um, on your list there, Tim. Back to you, Rob. Thank you, Peter. Wow, someone, someone else who's done an impressive amount of work and uh, very good results at the end of the day and more to come. So thank you for all our speakers. We're now gonna have a Q and A session. So are you gonna take over here, Peter? Or do you want me to? Okay, well, Robert, I'll, I'll pick up the Q&A if you like. Right, yeah. All right, so I'm just looking at the list here and we're, we're going to kick off tonight with a question for Peter um, from Lynn and Rod asking about how you access your sideway for maintenance if you need to. So that, uh, that section on the north side of your property. Yeah, very, very good question. Um, uh, it, it, it had its challenges and I, I guess uh, we, we, went, we went in early um, and put some hot, hot water tanks, not hot water tanks, sorry, some um, uh, rainwater tanks uh, down, down the side of our house. Of course, we didn't, we never guessed uh, what a barrier they might become to uh, accessing that, that side of the house. Um, uh, fortunately, we've got some good neighbours um, which uh, were able to sort of enable us to access the, our side of the house from, from their side of the fence. Uh, we, we removed a fence segment in essence. Um, uh, we've since had the fence replaced and, and as part of that fence replacement, um, the, there's, uh, the slats have, at the appropriate places have been, been screwed on and there's sort of pre-cuts there so we can remove it again in the future. But um, even if that wasn't there, I guess the worst case situation would be to, to have it to drain um, one of the, uh, the water tanks there and have it lifted out of the way temporarily um, and, and to have it reinstalled after, after work has been done. Um, it's, it's a job, I guess, particularly for the hot water service, which you know maybe ten years down the track, um, you know, will be a problem, maybe for me or maybe for the next person. Okay, thanks for that. Um, now, just point out that um, Mark asked a question about uh, insulation on a high raked ceiling, and uh, Tim has has put a couple of connections there for uh, ways of getting around that issue. Um, so that may affect some other people. So if if you're interested in how you improve the insulation between a um, what we've got here, the, uh, the really old exposed beams and the old tin roof. So some good suggestions there. Um, next one, we've got 
uh, question here, I'll put to Matt first and then Peter around a uh, question from Mark saying, if you're installing a, a solar PV system, um, your thoughts on sizing it, the, the kilowatt hour or the kilowatt size of it. So um, Mark's got two adults and, and one child. I suppose just from your experience, so perhaps Matt first, how did you pick the size of your solar PV? Yeah, so we um, went through um, an online calculator to work out what we um, what we needed, and then we got a few installers to come and look at our energy consumption. So I definitely base it off what you're currently using, and then try and add in a little bit more. At the moment, um, that six point six kilowatt system seems to be a really good price um, for a two person or two and a half person household. So we went with a 6.2 kilowatt system. Um, at the moment, it's definitely oversized, but we are looking to get an EV soon. So um, if you can future-proof it, um, maybe go around, start looking at that 6.6 .6 kilowatt system, um, and then you do jump up in cost to get a bigger inverter. So like a 10 kilowatt system, um, it does jump up in, in price. Um, you can add additional system, but it does get quite expensive. So try and future-proof it if you can. Okay. So. Peter, thoughts on, on how you picked your size? Yeah, look, I agree with Matt's point there. Sort of don't just think about the now, think about the future and, and what you might be adding further down the track. Um, look, there's no point um, uh, sizing it for, uh, you know, the, the summer energy generation. You've actually got to look at, at the winter energy generation because that's, that's the hardest time of the year to generate electricity, but it's also the time of the year when you, you consume the most. So having a, a, a bigger solar system will collect more energy in those over, on those overcast days. Um, our, our system um, being inclined at 10 degrees um, does collect a lot more of the dispersed lights on dispersed light on those low light days, um, uh, which is, is one benefit. Um, uh, the size of our system um, worked out basically to be, and coincidentally, we, we found a price point, which was um, a, a, a pack of 27, solar panels um, for the, the, um, the, the tall maxes was the, the standard sort of pallet size or the unit size of purchase, which uh, gave us a good price point and discount. It also happened to, to neatly cover uh, our roof um, without any, any over, overshadowing of, uh, between the panels and give us that, that shading benefit that I mentioned before. Um, but uh, coincidentally, and, and I guess this was maybe fortuitous after all that, because we've got a, a, a 7.2 kilowatt uh, vehicle charger um, uh, it's called a Zappy, which is uh, solar aware. It's able to take any any excess energy that we're otherwise exporting and, and put it into our car. So hence, you know, our, our solar consumption is so great. Um, uh, but but uh, as it turns out, you know, our solar system will generate um, about 60 kilowatt hours on a, on a sunny summer day um, with a 75 kilowatt hour battery in our, our car. It's a Tesla Model 3. Um, you know, 60 kilowatt hours in a day into that into the vehicle is, is just a solid good charge in a day. So you know, um, you know, the solar system being 8.6 of kilowatts of panels, 8.2 kilowatt inverter. So if you've got other usage in the house, plus the car charging, you know, on, a, on the peak of a summer's day, it looks about right in, in terms of what we want to do. But we do generate, you know, good, good on a, on a sunny winter's day, we'll, we'll generate some good energy as well, you know, and to be able to put all of that in the car and make use of it, as you've seen, um, you know, four and a half cents a kilometre there. Um, you know, when, when you can, you know, generate most of that electricity off your roof and get it into your car uh, is very, very cheap motoring. Okay. Thanks for that. Tim. Yeah. Um, I'll just add uh, something else, I suppose. Um, yeah. Don't, don't think about now. Think about the future. Don't think about January. Think about June. And uh, the guys have already mentioned that. I'll say this. Uh, at uh, my efficient electric home, we've got 57,000 members and we're waiting for the first person to tell us and express regret of having too much solar. We've not yet found that one person who has any regrets that their solar is too big. And the reason is because not every day is sunny. So um, yeah, you'll get winter days and, and some days it'll be cloudy. And uh, so you've got a June morning and you'd like to be generating some electricity so you can put that through your heat pump and heat your house. So um, the bigger, the better. So I do talk about, for, for new folks, I do talk about the logic of the roof so on your roof, what are the logical places where you could install it north, east, and west? And how much can you put there? And you might as well get a quote for that. And then you'll see what that costs filling up the whole roof. And then if you decide that breaks the budget, you just can't possibly do that. Well, then maybe you have to scale back a bit, but at least you'll know what might have been. 
And uh, really don't, don't have any ideas you'll add more panels later because um, you know, the rebates, et cetera, are never going to be better. So now's the time to do it, do it as big as you can and, um, and then don't have any regrets. Okay, thanks for that. All right, now next question we've got here is from Anne. I thought, Tim, you might like to give us a general comment on this one where Anne's saying she's got a 70s all electric house, concrete slab, concrete walls, low flat roof. So many insulation options aren't available. Lots of windows, so double glazing likely unaffordable. Uh, she's just got a concern about the options in terms of cost. Um, where, as an energy auditor, where would you suggest perhaps she might be able to make some changes and, and perhaps see a, an improvement without spending a lot of money? So, so you ring me up. I think I've got a date with Anne next week on Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Anne was explaining to me her house. Um, blah, 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 blah. Look, um, yeah, look, I. I'm going to be visiting the house and we'll see what we can come up with. I suppose, um, you know, it depends on the person's living situation, but if you get, if you can at least make part of the house comfortable and livable, maybe you're not going to be able to do the whole thing, but uh, if you can find at least part of it that uh, maybe you do treat some of the windows, but you're not going to be treating all of them. And uh, you definitely have a, a reverse cycle air conditioner in there. I don't know if the solar PV is going to be possible or not, but um, if you can at least make part of the, the house comfortable and, and don't be afraid to use the, the air con probably because it's probably gonna be costing you less than you thought if you do buy an efficient modern air conditioner, um, use it for heating. Don't be afraid to use it, uh, be, be healthy, be comfortable, um, monitor your electricity use, but you might be pleasantly surprised it's not costing you as much as you thought. Okay, so the, the message there is really it's, it's looking for options. There's, there's usually something you can do or, or cut down the size of what you're doing to, to fit a budget. Yeah, I've, I was in 170 homes last year and we always found an option. If we don't find an option, I might quit, but I think, I think we'll come up <laughs> with something. <laughs> okay, uh, next one uh, for Peter. We've got, uh, have you considered air deflectors for your hydronic heat pumps to minimize cold air going back through the system? That's from Dan. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Um, uh, yeah, look, interesting suggestion. No, I haven't considered deflectors. I, I, I'm, I, I'm not sure that cold air trap is, is, is a problem, or at least not very often. Um, as you saw from the, the, the photo, um, those heat pumps are elevated up on a stand. Um, so the, the lower one maybe is a little bit more exposed to the cold compared to the higher one, which tends to blow its air out over the top of the fence. Um, uh, Interesting though, in terms of deflectors, um, you know, I, I did have this idea when when the the, uh, the stand was being installed to put it at a slight angle so that rather than sort of drawing air and pushing it out, so there's a risk of it sort of circulating around that it would tend to push the air down the side of the house and, and take in, in, in new air. Um, the, the plumber didn't seem to be that excited about it at the end of the day because it introduced too many angles into his, his plumbing job, so it, it didn't happen. Um, the last thing, though, um, in regards to deflectors, though, um, you know, look, heat pumps do generate a little bit of noise, um, and and heat pumps that are heating water, um, you know, uh, tend to work at at full power because that's you know their, their job is to to get that water up, up to up to you know the high operating temperature, um, so they, they don't have a, a as much of a variable speed as as an air conditioning unit, you know, which is um, you know slowed down because uh, the, the rooms reach reach temperature. Um, so they, they can be a little bit noisier um, uh, and, and sort of I've, I've installed a little bit of soundproofing there, but it, I guess it hasn't been a particular issue because it, it, um, of, of the room that it happens to sit next to and, and our neighbour's house is, is a brick building. We've never had any, any complaints from there. If, if it's only one heat pump operating, um, it, it's pretty quiet um, uh, and you can, you can barely hear it. But the interesting thing with, with two heat pumps, and maybe this is a point of note, if people are familiar with the the uh, you know tw twin prop aeroplane problem. If you've got two props spinning at near, near the same speed but not quite the same speed, you get this as they, as they, as they, as they sort of slowly move in and out of sync. Um, so they they cancel each other out when they're when they're at you know, 180 degrees out of sync, and then they, they add to each other when they're they're perfectly in sync. And, and so there's like a 10 15 minute sort of noise and, and, and lower noise cycle that my heat pumps seem to seem to go through. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how it's possible to to, to stop that and, and make them always operate uh, 
180 degrees out of sync. But I, I just highlight to people that in noise and heat pumps, just be very careful where, where you locate them, um, especially if you've got a, a wooden house. Um, in, in the one picture that you saw there, um, uh, that, that you saw that there was um, some conduit running across from the, this freestanding unit, right? Fantastically di disconnected from the house. And then the electrician, because I wasn't watching, um, you know, connected the wires with the conduit straight to the side of the house. And so suddenly I had this vibration tap attaching to the side of the house. Um, that, that, was, that has since been redone. So the conduit runs down the side of the stand now and attaches to the house much, much lower down. So little gotchas there for people to be aware of um, in, in terms of how those heat pumps are set up. Okay, thanks for that. Um, question then for you, Matt, around your blow-in insulation. Uh, Dan's wondering, was that piped in down through the noggins or were there bricks removed? Yep, so we, um, we were quite happy that they were able to um, do it in stages. So we have um, roof tiles. So they went through the roof, I uh, lifted up the roof tiles and went down through the noggins and then around windows and other um, areas in the home that they couldn't access all the way through from the top. They ended up just drilling a little 10 cent piece through the mortar of the bricks. It didn't actually damage any bricks. They just pumped, they just did a little drill hole through the, through the mortar and then pumped in the remaining insulation to fill that external wall. Um, they do that if they were going to do internal walls as well. They just um, drill a little hole um, every stud to make um, to make the hole completely full of insulation. But we've elected not to do that just yet because it's another three and a half thousand dollars, um, and we're able to zone off the house um, just using doors and and um, sliding doors at the moment. But the external one was yeah a one day job um, with two people and yeah very happy with them. So yeah, highly recommend that 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 process 21. Okay. And that was through Enviroflex? Yeah, Enviroflex. So they're in Melbourne. Um, there seems to be maybe one one company um, in every state, but um, yeah, here in Melbourne, that's what they did. Okay, thanks for that. Um, now, Tegan's got a question around the order. Um, suggested order for retrofit measures. Um, so recently bought our first home, looking forward to getting it as comfortable and energy as efficient as possible. So what I was wondering, maybe we just go around, so sort of Tim, Matt, and then Peter. Tim, from your perspective, what are the things that you'd suggest in, in the average house, where do people start? What are the, the top couple of things to look at first? Well, a, a top couple is probably um, the draft proofing and particularly if you can do any of that DIY, so that's fairly low cost and then also if it's safe for you to get up in your roof space and check that insulation and make sure it hasn't been all strewn about. So those would be a, a top two, I suppose. But um, often when I, when I leave a, a consultation with clients, they still have a lot of extra information to go find out. So we'll talk about, okay, here's the things you could do, but um, you know, they still don't know the, exactly what the price of various things will be. And so I'd say continue, you know, come up with a list of things you could do and then start to get more information coming in just as to the cost of what it will be. And then that will adjust your priorities again. So you might think, you know, right now without having a lot of information, these might be the priorities, but uh, I'd say start, in, you know, investigations into five or six different things. And as you get more information, including cost information coming back, that'll probably reset the priorities again. Okay. So Matt, what, what was your experience in terms of priority? What, what were the first things that you jumped into? Yeah, so we, we were looking for a house during lockdown. So we had a lot of time and um, even with a short settlement, we had uh, 60 days to, to know that we we're going to be moving into this home. So we, we looked into the orientation, um, what we could do. Um, when we were looking at open floor inspections, we looked at um, windows. Um, I even went into the roof and then underneath the house in some of the inspections just to get a good idea if, if if there's any insulation um, and yeah, getting a good idea of the home um, uh, would be the first thing and then prioritizing your budget. So things like our windows were broken before we moved in. So um, definitely making sure that you're not wasting money um, uh, replacing like for like. And if you can be upgrading things um, that need replacing, then definitely focus on that. Um, so we were quite happy upgrading our windows and doors very early on. It was quite expensive, but we knew um, it would be a one, one solution that would, that would work. The, so the you, other, you, oh, sorry, Steph. 
I was just going to say the other thing we really focused on, which is what Tim said, was the insulation. So um, that was our priority, as well as getting the solar panels on the roof. So they were actually a bit of a, we were lucky enough to come in with a 20 cent feed in tariff. Um, so they were a bit of a money maker for us to help us keep doing more um, on the house and a bit of an incentive as well um, to reduce our energy use so that we could get the most out of that. So, okay. So it was really around the envelope of the house, the, the insulation, the windows mm. sort of start there. So Peter, what were your experience? I mean, yeah, look, all, all of the above, um, you know, thinking ahead, you know, what, what are the things that are likely to fail soon? I mean, we, we, we obviously had a, an air conditioning unit that failed. We had a hot water system uh, um, that had at least partially failed and was reliant on, on, on a gas booster. We had a very old gas boiler that was costing us more and more money every year. So, you know, that really gave me the priority where to, to focus, you know, some, some key expenses on. But, you know, doing some of those things took, it was some years in the making sometimes. And, you know, again, I encourage people to sort of read the article, sort of, learn out you know to, to understand sort of some of the testing and experimenting I did along the way to make sure that I guess if we were to do a, a gas to electric hydronic system that our existing you know pipes and, and, and panels that sit in the house were going to work um, with, with, with a heat pump system. Um, so you know it, it takes time you can't make fast decisions in this space use every opportunity every time a, a, a tradesperson comes to your house ask them questions you know get them to teach you and, and about about your house at the end of the day, document it um, so that uh, you can make more educated decisions when, when, when the time comes. And, and certainly, you know, like I said, with the, the switchboard, you know, get those electrical systems up to scratch because, um, you know, they're the things that are going to slow you down if you have to make a fast change. Okay. So that, that's a good point around appliances, that if there's things there that are ageing, look, look for alternatives. So Tim, thought on that? Yeah, just, just the, the hot water is a key one, particularly the old gas storage units, which, you know, can fail um, when, you know, they usually fail at Christmas or, um, you know, <laughs> the worst possible times. Sometimes there's dates on the hot water heaters, and so you can get a bit of a feel for it, uh, you know, and so like if, it, if it's 10 years old, well, you might want to get your head across what is a hot water heat pump, because you may not know what a hot water heat pump is, and the, and the first five plumbers you ring up, they're not going to know what hot water heat pumps are either. So um, getting the whole hot water heat pump thing in is, is not something you want to do on Christmas Eve. So um, try to uh, plan ahead for, for that one. You don't, want to be, you don't want to be cold, wet, and naked trying to make good decisions about uh, future hot water systems. <laughs> yeah, and I just would quickly add to that, you know, especially if those things fail in the winter, your family is going to put you under so much pressure to get that hot water service fixed and that heating fixed pronto. Um, so don't expect to make big decisions uh, when you're under that sort of pressure. Yeah, and the house we bought, we didn't replace, we haven't replaced our hot water yet. Um, and we only just replaced our gas heater. And that was purely because they were relatively new when we purchased the house. So um, it was something that we plan to do when they start to fail. Okay. Um, Tim, a general question for you from Jared around uh, using your house in the interior as a battery in terms of storing heat or storing cool in the house. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I probably did that today. I wasn't in the house today, but I thought it'd be a bit sunny. So I just turned the air conditioners on. Um, so that's pretty cheap heating. And uh, so then you come home and shut them off. And uh, if the house has you know, got a reasonable thermal envelope and if it wasn't gonna be that cold tonight, we'll probably cruise through the whole evening without ever turning the heat back on again. So sure, that's, a, that's another uh, way to store uh, energy, kind of a thermal battery. Now it's just a weatherboard, so it's not really got anything to do with thermal mass other than the thermal mass of the couch. Um, but uh, that, that's a trick you can try. And then we're, we're on the low feed in tariff. So we only get six cents for selling the electricity, might as well try and use it. Okay. And so it's a combination of, of that plus the, the good insulation. You, you must have that draft ceiling and, and the insulation. Otherwise, you're just losing it out there. Okay. So that um, so suggestion there, Joe, that would be a good thing to do if you've got the insulation, um, take advantage of the, the energy. Uh, question here, Matt. Uh, did you put a whole new layer of red brick on the wall with insulation between the old cement wall and the new brick wall? We considered it, definitely. Um, external insulation is definitely something um, other countries do as a deep retrofit. But for us, our wall cavity is actually quite thick. Um, it's um, over 200 millimetres, I reckon, as a guess. So the blow-in insulation... Um, 
actually brought up the insulation in the external wall to quite a good level. So we're quite happy just having external brick, our blow-in insulation, which was um, very thoroughly installed. So there's no air gaps, because that's the main issue with insulation. If it's not installed correctly, um, you actually do lose a lot of that potential insulating value. And then just plaster. And we've definitely made sure that um, all our penetration from the internal to the external have all been sealed up to our best ability. So yeah, when they're getting plumbing done on, on taps and penetrations through your laundry, making sure they're all sealed up um, and airtight definitely helps with, um, with drafts. Okay, thanks for that. Um, just while we're talking about insulation, Peter, you showed the photo there. You had very care, uh, took a great deal of care to make sure the insulation was all put in. Do you have any numbers on, on how much you, you lose if there's gaps? Does a small gap make a big difference? Uh, Tim can probably comment more, more than I can there, but, you know, I guess every hole matters at the end of the day, um, be it you know, holes because of lighting or holes because of, of poorly installed uh, um, bats. Yeah, there's, there's a curve you can look up in the books and it, uh, you know, drops off really quickly. I think it's, you know, 5% gaps. Well, your insulation is really then only doing 50% of what you thought it was. So um, my analogy is, um, you know, it's a very cold night and you've got a doona, but your leg's hanging out, you're not going to be comfortable, you're not going to sleep very well. So I've uh, got to cover up that leg as well. Okay, so it can be as small as five or 10% gap. And that, oh, that's yeah. Maybe, right. Yeah, okay. it's, just, it's just perfect what we've done with this stupid halogen downlight legacy. We mm. buggered up all the insulation in Victoria. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Our house was old enough that we didn't have downlights. So we yeah, you're so it. far behind your head. That's the way to be. <laughs> Back <laughs> to the future. There is insulation. <laughs> okay, um, Dan's got a question here. Tim, he's asking about heat recovery systems. Um, your opinion on HRVs or HRSs to move heat around a house or is it only useful for a well sealed, like in the passive house? The, um, that's probably a bit complicated just to make sure that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of what, what Dan's thinking about. Um, I guess it comes up quite often, like somebody will have a couple split systems in a house, but that still leaves a couple rooms that aren't really being directly heated or cooled. So what can you do? And then people do talk about chopping holes through the walls to try to move air from one room to the other. And, you know, often I say, well, it's a couple thousand dollars for another air conditioner, you know, if that uh, really gets you there. Um, yeah, full blown heat recovery ventilation system. I've never lived with um, one. I'm sure they're they're really great, but I think um, well, there, there are some small scale ones that like the Lunos system, which doesn't involve ducting. But if you're talking about a big ducted system, that's probably something you have to do in a house as it's being built as opposed to being a retrofit. Okay. Uh, you, Howard, I don't know. You may know more about that than I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess it depends. I think you're right in terms of design. If the house is designed for that, you've got all the, the draft and everything taken care of. Um, I'm not sure it's something you can add later and get the same sort of success with it that you would with a well sealed house. Matt, so any experience with those? We're, we're quite optimistic that we're fairly airtight, but until we actually get tested um, to see how airtight we are, we mm. are considering um, getting some sort of airflow um, from inside to outside of the home, but until we get tested, we don't really know. Um, so that's something that I'd consider um, before you start taking out walls and, and things like that. Okay. Um, now, speaking of taking out walls, um, we've got a question here about Matt. Uh, you said it was quite expensive to remove a load bearing wall and open up your living area. Uh, did you do a lot of that yourself? Um, because this person has been told doing something similar will cost hundreds of thousands in a house with a trust roof where internal walls are not load bearing. So thoughts on that? So our wall was load bearing, but it cost 10,000. Um, to take it out. We didn't do any of that ourselves though. So we've done most of what we've done on our house ourselves, um, but we didn't want to um, play with a load bearing wall given um, neither of us are builders. My father-in-law was very keen to take it out, um, but we ended up getting um, some trades people in and they suggested um, we could do it in timber if it was only the wall. Um, it would grow to steel, which would be a lot more offensive if you just went half a metre further into the home. So it was a good compromise. Um, yeah, get a good tradesperson in and they can talk you through it. Um, but definitely get, you know, like anything, get a few quotes because we did get some quotes that were way outside of that building. 
Oh, okay. So the first one may not be a, an accurate. Yeah. Yep. And right. and looking for the function. So we use really one of the kitchen. So we're sitting in the dining room, and behind us is the is the lounge room. We've lived in homes where um, those two spaces have been very separate. So getting the benefit of having an open plan home, at least in the dining, living, kitchen area, was definitely worth the ten thousand dollars. But again, it wouldn't have been worth the forty thousand that we got quoted. Okay. Um, another question here for Tim around uh, Victorian government rebates to replace old uh, transformers, new LED transformers. Um, what's the best way to try and access this? So have you got any tips on, on how to do that? Because the feeling is the website's just a bit too bland, not enough specific information. Um, so this is uh, LED lighting. Yeah. Um, yeah, what, what I caution against, the, the, free, the free thing, um, as far as I know, you know, they'll send folks out. They may, they're probably not electricians. I'm not sure, but they're they're certainly capable of changing the bulb. So you can change the the you know a, a halogen bulb to an LED bulb, but then you're still stuck with the the older transformer in the roof space, and you're you're also probably left with that leaky bulb. And Peter showed us a good example of those leaky bulbs. So so I'm not sure that um, the whole free uh, downlight business is really a good option these days. If you have someone come out to, you know, just replace your old screw in incandescent and fluoro light bulbs with LED light bulbs, well, then that's a, that's a great opportunity. Um, well, I mean, always be sure with that you're happy with the bulb that they leave you with. Don't take something you're not happy with. But in terms of the ceiling thing, I'd rather go with a, with a more sealed sort of LED. I don't know if Peter's going to grab one for us or something. Um, they have these, you know, your basic LED downlight these days. Um, can't it can quite. be just a white diaphragm. I'm not sure that's what Peter's got. His might be a bit more sparkly, but just the white diaphragm sorts of things. You see them everywhere these days. I call them light from God because um, they give you quite a broad beam angle and can bring a lot of light into a place, but they can be, you know, they're not necessarily sealed against the plaster, but they're tied up against the plaster. So they're probably not gonna leak very much compared to those old ventilated lights. So yeah, if you had someone come in and give you free light bulbs, but you're still left with holes into your roof space, that's, that's not a great achievement. And, um, you know, there's the thermal issues, but there's also the air quality issues. I've been up in a lot of roof spaces and it's not nice up there. So you really don't want air moving back and forth between your living space and your roof space through those um, gaps around the downlights. Okay. Mm -hmm. I suppose yeah, the, 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 that the raises a, a yeah. general question then that maybe Peter and Matt could address in, in terms of finding a good electrician. I mean, if you're gonna replace those transformers, you want somebody who knows what they're doing. How do you go about finding somebody you can get a good price from and knows what they're doing <laughs> um, um yeah well we when we moved we hadn't we moved um from the eastern suburbs of melbourne to the north suburbs so we didn't know anyone that lived here at the time um and we actually found a lot of those good karma websites for the local area and asked a few locals um, for some recommendations that was um, how we did it and then really when you do get them into your house to talk about the options um, really listen to what they've got to say and um, yeah use that to help make your mind up some people you'll find you know with anything they'll they'll talk your ear off and um, they'll try and sell you the world but they won't actually solve your solution um, the best ones we've had have been people have really thought out of the box, um, you know, particularly with our um, floor gas heater, when we wanted to get that replaced, we were just going to replace it with a, a like for like. So a floor um, reverse cycle, which sit around the, the five grand mark. Um, we'd had two sparkies slash um, the other sparkies yeah. come in uh, to quote that up. Both just quoted us what we were asking for. Um, the last one we had came in went, well, have you actually thought about putting um, the wall split system in, it'll cost you two, two, three grand less um, and it'll be a better heat. And so, you know, just that um, thinking outside of the box is really good and we, we went with him. Okay, and, and, and local. So, and local. Peter, what, what are your thoughts? How, how would you find somebody? Yeah, look, we were fortunate to be introduced to a, a, a good electrician as, as part of our overall major system upgrade. Um, and I've, I've stuck with that electrician now for the last sort of five or six years. Um, you know, he did the, the, the switchboard upgrade and, and really knows our house front to back, uh, you know, in, in terms of how it's been set up. Um, uh, 
and and I would agree with everything else that, that the others have said as well. You know, to try and find a, a person that's sort of aligned in your thinking around what what you're trying to achieve as well, um, uh, so, so that you know you, you're able to sort of collaborate together. I, um, not so much electricians, but but certainly plumbers. Um, you know, I I I had a a plumber come in looking at our hydronic heating with a, a faulty valve at one stage. This was this was years ago. And, um, you know, I asked him at the time about electric heat pump, hydronic and, and alternatives. This is before the changeover. And, and look, he, he was a gas plumber, you know. As far as he was concerned, everything had to have gas and, and anything that he couldn't come in and, and, and do the whole job, you know, connecting up the water, connecting the gas and, and plugging it into a general power point for, for the little bit of electrics that are required. Um, you know, that was a whole job for him that he could do on his own. Uh, with, with these these heat pump systems, you need a plumber and you need an electrician, and um, uh, you know I don't I don't think the plumber likes that. Um, the plumber prefers that you know, they work on their own. So likewise, if you you know finding a good plumber in this space that has air conditioning experience um, and uh, you know it ha has you know good knowledge of, of installing heat pumps well. Um, it, I think is a, is a particular challenge over and above uh, finding just a good electrician. Okay. All right. So um, Jackie's given us a, a point here. If we're talking about heat pumps and, and that concern about noise, that we do need to be aware that the regulations are Monday, Friday, but before 7 a.m. and after 10 p.m. and weekends before 9 a.m. and after 10 p.m. So maybe that's something just to be aware of the location of it. And is there going to be a noise issue for, for people next door? Maybe not for you in a comfortable, uh, well-insulated, double-glazed window situation, not hearing anything, but next door might not be quite as, as comfortable. So that's something to be aware of. Yep, Matt? Yeah, so we've got, not neighbours too close, but we are in a, a, a residential area. Um, and I've already found the air conditioning unit that we have does have a quiet mode. So, but again, if you're, if you're pre-warming your home um, or running your, your hot water system or your heat pump, um, during daylight hours, then yep. yeah, you might not have to run um, many appliances at night, which would be good. Yeah, that's true. So you, you've actually eliminated that problem because you don't need to run them. Okay. Uh, now, last one for tonight, and we're almost out of time anyway, which is good. Now, this is a general one for the uh, for the group. Uh, Mark's asking about: Does anybody know about insulated colour bond roof panels? Would this be a useful option to replace existing tin roof? And install on top of the exposed beam rate ceilings. Has anybody got any thoughts, comments? No, nope. <laughs> that's um, Matt. I know Stratco do one. Um, it's mainly for um, extensions, but I'm sure they could they could help you with a replacement for a, a main structure. Okay, so so that might be something. Tim, would you suggest that sort of thing? Lots of research and and try and find out. What sorts of things are available and go from there yeah how would i just would add at one point there is i guess before you get solar pv installed on a tin roof for example make sure the tin's in good condition um and, and and sort of structurally sound and not rusty or dented in places or whatever and anything that might at, at the end of the day undermine the, the 25 year lifetime plus of, of your, your solar system you know you've got to make sure that your roof is going to last that long too okay all right. Uh, well, that's the end of our question session. So thank you very much for our presenters. I'll hand you back to, to Rob to uh, finish up our session for tonight. Thank you, Howard. But I've got one question for particularly for Tim. Um, and I come across it quite a lot around here. People with gas central heating systems, they like the type of heat, but they'd like to um, replace the gas heater with an electric heat pump. How practical is that? So you're, you're talking about a ducted gas heating. Yeah. Um, right. So um, if you're interested in replacing ducted gas heating with ducted reverse cycle heating, that can be done. But uh, chances are you're going to find that the, uh, they'll want to replace your ducts. Mm -hmm. And um, they may well want to uh, enlarge like the, uh, the outlets for the ducts. Um, because the heat coming out of a, an aircon system won't be quite as hot as the as the gas heat as the gas heat was, and um, so they may need to move more air, and so that means the the size of the ducts, etc., can change. And also because you'll be using the system for cooling as well, that's a different size of duct. So um, 
it can't be done. Say you've got ducted gas heating through the floor, through the ceiling. Yeah, you can get ducted reverse cycle air conditioning as well through the floor, through the ceiling, but it's it's probably going to be largely a, a complete replacement of the stuff that you've got there. Which makes it uneconomic. I was just wondering if oh, well, um, you get a high oh, temperature, higher temperature. Um, I'd still say the economics would be favorable because you're getting off gas and gas is expensive and only going to be more expensive. Uh, but um, but you might you might find that um, instead going with a with an unducted system is better, which in other words is split systems or even multi headed split systems, etc. And Robin, you and I did a uh, did a uh, renew uh, webinar on that. So if people look at the renew YouTube channel. Um, you can search my name, Tim Forsey Heat Pumps Part 2. That was about space heating and cooling, so we might have talked about some of that stuff. We did, yeah. Good, thanks, Tim. Um, now, before I, th I formally thank you all, um, we are always looking for assistance uh, in ideas for future meetings, and maybe some help in uh, finding speakers and finding topics and assisting on the night. Um, so if anybody is interested, if they could contact Chris and uh, we'll go from there. Um, well, tonight's been a great evening, I think very, very informative. Um, and hopefully all our attendees have learned something and will apply something fairly soon. Um, I always find these thank yous a bit um, poor on Zoom in that um, you can't see everybody or any anything going on. So you have to sort of imagine that there's hundreds of people clapping away in the background. Uh, and that would certainly be the, the case for the three of you tonight. So, or four of you tonight. So thank you all very much. And um, I'll call it an evening there. Thank you. <laughs>